Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Tanya Newhouse, and I'm the CEO of Clevita. Uh And uh, this is our first webinar, and uh, so thank you for joining me. Um, a little later on, I'm going to introduce you to my colleague, Martin uh, Lewison. Uh, we're really excited to speak to you today about uh, intelligent virtual agents. This is a subject that we've uh, often presented to conferences. Uh, so it's great to be in a different medium uh, this morning. Uh, we expect that this session will probably run perhaps around 30, 35 minutes and then we've allowed some time for questions at the end. So I'm going to uh, get started now with the, uh, uh, with the presentation. Now is that sharing? Fantastic. Uh, we're going to talk today about uh, customer service impact but before we start, um, actually, before we start, I'll, I'll just share with you uh, what we intend to cover. Um, I've already introduced myself. Um, we're going to begin by talking about what an intelligent virtual agent is, um, some, some of its background uh, from a research point of view and application areas, um, how they can be used to engage emotionally, which is perhaps not something you might imagine uh, a chatbot or a virtual agent can do. Uh, we're going to be talking about the value of a face, uh, how adding a face and a voice to a virtual agent uh, can create impact. And then we're going to talk about how a proof of concept could be developed in your organisation um, and some of our philosophy around that and then we'll announce some time for questions. Alright, let's get started. So what is an IBA for? What's an intelligent virtual agent for? Well, firstly, what, what actually is it? Uh, a lot of people ask me the question, oh, is it, is it just a chat bot? And that's a, that's a reasonable question. Um, in fact, it is a type of chat bot. Now, chat bots have a kind of bad name at the moment. They're seen as being very simple um, and perhaps not very useful, but that's really because of their heritage. Chat bots have actually been around for a few decades now. And a chat bot is a computer program uh, with whom you have a conversation. And it's the conversation that's the important part. Um, now, a chatbot uh, can be smarter by adding um, uh, perhaps uh, an integration with, uh, with another system, or it can have some artificial intelligence to improve, its, um, to improve the intelligence of its responses. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it's designed to hold a conversation. So an intelligent virtual agent is the, the term that we prefer to use. Uh, it is designed to hold a relationship and to help customers. Now, that's what chatbots have been commercialised to do. Um, originally, they were fun, and now they have a very serious purpose. Now, chatbots hold these conversations, or IVAs hold these conversations in a few different ways. Um, they can be led by, as you can see, the decision tree on the left. They can be led by the bot by taking the, asking the question users, uh, asking the user questions, and then taking them down a pathway, uh, a bit like a choose your own adventure. So that's a if then kind of uh, scenario. Um, so that's a, a dialogue tree, or it could be led by the user, and that's where the user might ask a question in free text. Um, often that's assisted by natural language processing, and uh, and sometimes those uh, that those two types of forms can be joined together. So conversations um, uh, can be driven in, in both ways. I guess what's really important is that bots are becoming, or uh, intelligent virtual agents are becoming far more prevalent. Um, Gartner makes the comment that, uh, that a full 15% of customer service interactions will be handled by AI uh, by next year. Um, uh, perhaps that will be the case, it seems quite soon, but um, certainly they're becoming far more, far more prevalent. Now, of course, not everyone needs one. And if you're wondering, do I need a chatbot or do I need an IBA for my organisation? I guess here's the question to ask. Are conversations useful? Are you already having conversations with your customers? Um, perhaps uh, you, know, you have a website that um, is very form-driven and it doesn't need conversations. Um, but perhaps you, you are having conversations. So you might be having conversations where you're um, understanding what the customer's query is, or perhaps you're coming having conversations because you want to learn more about your customer. Um, a proxy might be when you already have a contact centre. 
you need to ask whether your customers actually want to have their own, uh, want to self-serve. Um, oftentimes they do, um, but it is an important question to ask. And where well, digital scale is important, so um, many thousands of users and, and 24-7. And the real question here is how valuable are your conversations? Um, and that, that's a way to consider whether, whether an IBA would be suitable in your organisation. So in terms of testing the concept for uh, it, of an IBA in your organisation, here are some principles to consider. We'll be talking a little later on about the process, but I'm going to start by talking about some of the principles. One of the first things to consider is uh, doing a low-cost proof of concept. So quite a narrow scope, um, but still enables uh, you to gather enough data to prove whether um, this is an effective channel for your customers. In, alongside of that, you want to be complementing existing services, not replacing them. Now, maybe that's something that can be achieved, but initially, we want to hold um, the IBA side by side with existing interactions. It's also a really great way to uh, have the baseline because you know what services that are provided now. As part of it, any interaction with an uh, intelligent virtual agent, you want to set your customer expectations right from the word go. Um, we, we, we've all had the experience, many people certainly have the experience where a chatbot's been disappointing. Part of that is because it is a conversational interaction, we do have higher expectations of the, uh, of the computer program, of the, of the chatbot. We expect that it's going to be more human-like, more intelligent. And so it's really important that as part of a as part of any interaction with an IBA, we explain or the IBA explains, this is what I can do, this is what I can do for you, this is what I can do for you. Part of that, of course, is building in uh, exit points, recovery points, so enabling the user to drive the interaction uh, and uh, not just be sucked out of a rabbit warren uh, from which they have no escape. Um, of course, you want to measure outcomes, gather data, and then make your decision uh, to um, continue based on that. We have the concept very much at Clever Tower with minimum viable product. What's really quite interesting about IBAs is that they are helpful, but they can also engage emotionally. And this is something that we um, particularly focus on at Clever Tower and something that my colleague Martin will talk about in a moment a little more. But it offers uh, for our customers an opportunity to engage in areas that perhaps they haven't considered before, far beyond just simply technical support. So situations where the customer emotion is high. So you might have um, positive emotions, perhaps customers are inquiring or enthusiastic, but you also might have negative emotions, concern, frustrated, uh, anxious, distressed, fearful. And they're often situations that, uh, that our customers uh, face with their own consumers. What we use, the, the approach that we take is that we apply scripts that are already in place or already in use by humans. People know how to talk to their customers. And so we very much rely on those scripts that are already in place, that expert knowledge. We enhance the relational aspect of our intelligent virtual agents with a virtual character. Um, we're very goal driven, so, um, and, and part of that is our heritage, which is actually in health. So, helping people achieve their goals, and maybe that goal is actually to purchase something or, or to get some assistance, but it is always about achieving. And finally, using a range of uh, engagement techniques. Now, today we're going to focus uh, specifically on number two, so enhancing the relational aspect via a virtual character. In future um, webcasts, we'll talk about um, uh, those other points, but today we're going to be talking about a virtual character and how that enhances the relationship. The really interesting thing about engaging emotionally is that 
you can use it, you can use your IVA to create to create a relationship and to influence. And this leads to results that are perhaps surprising. Uh, empathy, um, uh, companionship, um, a, a willingness to engage over a period of time with a, with a virtual person, with, a, with an intelligent virtual agent. And this is the, uh, these are the sorts of outcomes that we, that we find that we achieve uh, here at Clevertar. But to talk a little bit further about the, uh, the basis, the, the, the research background and why we do what we do, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Dr. Martin Lewiston, my colleague, CTO and co-founder, and I'll hand that to you and then I'll join you uh, back in, at the end. Thank you, Tanya. Hello, everyone. I'm the CTO at Clevertar. I lead the a technology team as well as our scientific efforts and in the previous life I was a university researcher in the uh, space of cognitive science and artificial intelligence and that is where the origins of Clavata actually lie. They lay in a multi-university effort to explore how humans communicate and um, try to actually replicate that. Right. So um, when we think about how humans communicate, well nowadays many of us who, who don't think that we communicate with each other, but through a phone or through some other smart device. And that, um, that's a bit different from, a, from, a, uh, from the kind of uh, interaction that we used to have. Because if we end interact through a phone, we might interact through, say, text. Okay? Because that is suitable for the media. And our ability to adapt to this particular communication medium has meant that you know, uh, technologies such as chatbots have been able to take off because you know, linked up with text, and text is easier to, to emulate for a computer and therefore create an experience that is like interacting with a real human if we were interacting just through text. But if you put two humans into a room, they're unlikely to communicate through a phone. They would uh, put the phone aside and they would communicate face to face. And likewise, I think most of us would prefer interacting with a business through a person rather than through an app, even if it's a very streamlined and sophisticated app, uh, as long as we don't have to go through the inconveniences of interacting with humans, which might involve, you know, standing in a queue or something like that. Um, so, when we interact naturally, it's, it's a quite different experience. It's a much richer experience than, than if we interact with text. Okay. It is something where we use our entire body to communicate. We use our speech, the way we speak, we use gestures, posture, facial expressions, we use a whole bunch of verbal and non-verbal behaviors to communicate our intent, and we also get feedback while we're communicating from other people through a very uh, subtle cues. And that interaction is in itself uh, a much more intimate, intimate interaction. It is one that we have been honing over uh, our anti-evolutionary uh, cultural history. It's the only way we've been able to communicate until quite recently, and we're very, very good at it. And it's still very important if you're trying to make friends, if you're trying to build a business deal, we're trying to lead a political revolution. Being physically present to communicate your message makes an enormous difference. So we can quite clearly say that uh, interacting face to face is a better way than, say, writing a text message, as long as it's possible to do so. Um, so, can we reproduce some of the magic of the face to face interaction with the computer? Can we? Go beyond the ordinary chatbot and bring some of that that that, that specialness of interacting face to face to the interaction of the computer. Well, to do that, we need to make the computer more human-like, and we can do what Professor Ishiguro does here in this particular frame: create a clone of ourselves, that is a robot that looks like ourselves, an android, um, and make it behave like us. The impractical part of that is that material science and mechanical engineering haven't progressed uh, far enough for that to be completely seamless. It won't be perfect, and uh, particularly when it moves, and it's also really expensive. So, you know, it's not particularly like that you're going to deliver uh, an Android to your customer or every customer who wants to impact with your business. Um, but what has improved over the years has been the ability for communities to simulate, to, to emulate, to create virtual things that look very real. If you look 20 or 30 years ago at, at movies or, or video games, you'll see that things have changed quite radically. Um, so this is not a photo, it's not even a painting, it's pretty model created by a, obviously a very talented hobbyist. Um, and I can't really tell that it's not a real person. Okay? So, so we reach a level there that, that is, 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 is quite, um, quite, quite real. I, I 
But that's of course not the only thing that we need to be able to do in order to create uh, a, you know, a person to talk to. Okay? For that, we need to give that person motion, they have to move around, they have to, to speak, we need to be able to listen to them. But it's also an interactive experience. All right? um, when we talk to somebody, we get a lot of feedback from them through their actions. They will only talk when we stop talking and so on. So we need perceptual abilities. We need intelligence, the ability to actually come up with something to say in first place to what's saying. Um, all of those spaces, they are all intensely researched by academia, by, by commercial entities. And there's been a lot of progress, particularly over the last few years. But bringing them all together into something that's perfect, that, that's just indistinguishable from real human being. Well, we're not there, not even close. We are at least a technical more off from that particular go. Uh, sometimes you hear uh, organizations promising that that will come sooner, but there are significant challenges around that. And one of the reasons why it's a challenge is that we know what other humans are like. We spend a lot of time with them after all, right? Um, and that poses, well, a bit of a challenge as well. Over the history of, of mankind, the most important entity that we've had with is other human beings. We're very social creatures. We, uh, we have large social groups and, and complex social interactions. Um, your success is quite dependent on your ability to, to interact with other human beings. And our brain really does reflect that. Okay? We need to be able to, to quite rapidly determine whether somebody is trustworthy, whether somebody is trying to lie to us, somebody is perhaps sick. Um, all of those interactions are going to be quite significant in determining our own survival. And, and the brain, the human brain, has grown quite a bit through its history with a lot of social processing capabilities. The ability to pick up on social cues, cues that, um, that facilitate our human interactions um, rapidly. Okay? There are certain features that we look at to see whether somebody is trustworthy, for example, and they can be quite superficial. Um, and, but we can make those uh, estimations really quickly. Okay? So we're really, really good at working out what another human being is, what, what they should be like, what they're doing, we can, we can plan around that. Uh, we can do that very quickly. The problem with that is, of course, that, that we are, we are uh, triggered in the past, of course, only by real human beings. Nowadays, it's possible to create virtual creations that are not quite human, but they're, they're somewhat human, and that trigger some of those same uh, abilities of ours, ours and, and emotions that we have in response to those. Of, of, of humanness. So you might have heard of the uncanny valley effect, that, that re response that people have when they see something that is human-like, particularly an issue in the, in the movie industry, where the industry has been quite keen on replicating real human beings with, uh, with, with characters that look like human beings, and people don't always respond very positively to that. And the reason for that is that we're all experts at what a human being should be like, and we can pick up on even the smallest cues that indicate that something's wrong. And those small cues are usually the same cues that we use to work on whether somebody's got some trustworthy. So we respond quite negatively to that. That is the uncanny value. But we do respond fairly positively to things that are human like, that have human expressions, human eyes, um, human behavior. Okay? And there are lots of artifacts in our world that um, reflect that, you know, teddy bears for them. Right? Um, but also in movies, animated characters. Okay? If we look at Disney characters, for example, we find that these particular Disney characters in particular have been extremely popular. They have millions of fans, they make billions of dollars, people love them. But anatomically, they're not correct at all, right? If you met them on the street, you'd think, oh, wow, well, there's something seriously wrong here. But we actually love them. I mean, hey, look, there's a, there's a talking a snowman here, okay? And, and people love it, all right? So it doesn't have to be perfect for people to have a very strong, positive emotional response to. Uh, uh, to these, these, these creations. And in fact, you can uh, leverage that to change people's behavior, like a toothpaste that I is promoted by frozen characters, and my children are more likely to enjoy that toothpaste because of that. Right? Um, can we use a similar effect to make the interaction with a computer uh, more engaging and powerful as well? Well, the answer to that is yes, we can. Researchers have done that over the last two decades plus. Um, you talk in this particular context about relational agents. The relational agent is a software, it's not a computer program, it doesn't try to be just a tool, but actually a partner. Someone that will build a relationship, a 
social relationship with you, someone that you might perceive as a friend, you know, if it's just proximate. Okay, so here we have some examples of that. We have an exercise a coach, we have a robot that helps elderly people uh, with loneliness, a, a, a talking teddy bear that uh, helps uh, sick children to overcome emotional difficulties, and a virtual character that deals with PTSD. All of those achieve uh, significant outcomes in changing people's moods and behavior. It is quite impressive, uh, particularly because it is much more effective than a normal computer in the case that doesn't have a face, that doesn't have some kind of uh, a virtual or real body. Okay, so creating a virtual, computer programs with virtual characters is something that has been shown to be quite effective. Um, but of course, 20 years ago, when when this was kind of started at MIT and the other research institutions. Um, they needed small supercomputers to make this happen. Technology has changed a lot since. Computers have become much, much faster, and as a result of those computational capabilities, computers have, with, even without the, the consideration of virtual characters or virtual agents, have become much more human-like. So the interaction that we have with the computer has become more visual. We can use speech and gestures as the next frontier that's being explored right now. At the same time, interaction with the computer has become much less one about barking commands at the computer, but one about uh, conversations, interactions back and forth. The computer actually remembering what, what you've said. And the end point of all of these sort of trends is really to give the computer so much personality that the computer program deserves a face. All right? That is the idea of a virtual being, the term virtual being is a term that has been promoted quite a bit over the last year or so. And we have a few companies in this space now, lots of startups that are working in this space and they're very excited about it. So here are some examples. Um, there's Lucy at the top left, she won an Emmy Award for the fiction of an in, interactive virtual character. We've got some other examples in the middle, middle of Samsung Neon, very hyped up just, just two months ago. Um, at CS, we've got Micah, a virtual character living in an um, in a, in a mixed reality environment, and we also have a little Miguela, which is actually not interactive, but you'll find lots of promotional material around her music videos where she's dancing with rhythm beings, just showing how virtual characters have become really something that pop culture in particular is really accepting right now, and something that's quite powerful in, in, in delivering um, interactions with your customers and with, with your brand. Um, at Clever, of course, we have our own team of uh, professionals, virtual professionals, or you know, virtual agents that have uh, helped um, um, people and businesses to, to achieve um, um, various outcomes, ranging from health improvement to um, promoting um, uh, brand awareness and, and other uh, and supporting uh, the business in general. And um, these virtual characters are available to, um, to, uh, to you. To everyone, we have lots of different virtual characters and they can be customized and they can be given uh, different things to say and do and interact with, with your services to deliver a, a, a new way in which um, customers can actually interact with, with your service. And uh, we do that through, um, we are, we're primarily a, a software as a service provider. We have a presence in, in the internet and um, by signing up with us, we deliver a bunch of different services. They consist of a number of components. I will go through them right now because they give you a good indication of what we can do. So from our cloud service, we serve a content management system that allows you to create content for those virtual characters, to get the conversations that they're going to deliver, the interactions that they would have with you, and as well with other systems. Um, and you'll be able to preview what the character says. Um, you'll be able to customize the character and and, and see what the end user actually experiences. We also have a web client. Um, so the, the end user, the, the customer of the business, for example, will uh, be able to interact with the virtual character on any side where you put this particular web client, or if you don't actually have a web client, we can actually serve it directly from our service. Um, so if you don't have a website. Um, and finally, we also have a, a native app, or actually micro native apps that, that deliver the virtual character. Onto, um, onto your phone through an native app if you don't really use browser to deliver the virtual character. In addition to that, we have um, Clavatar's expertise and, and support to actually make sure that whatever we come up with is going to be a total success. And we can integrate this technology, or you can integrate through our API 
with all sorts of other services and capabilities to create something that's much bigger than the sum of its parts. So let me just go through those components again with a little bit more detail to show you what we can really do. And let's start with the CMS because it's the first thing that you'd see if you sign up to our service or, or want to create something in our service. With the CMS, you have a graphical conversation editor that allows you to de define uh, how uh, end users will interact with your virtual tracker, what your virtual tracker will say, um, and how it will respond to, to any responses that the users provide. Um, you can customize the character, you can give it a different look, different colors. Um, we're extending the character set all the time and providing more and more customizability. Brand, where you can add logos to your characters. Any changes that you make, customers will see them immediately. You can deploy things instantaneously, and how future customers will experience the new conversation of the new look immediately. Uh, all the data is collected by the interaction with the, with the character. Anything the users are saying goes back to the system and is available to you as reports that you can customize, that you can drill into to see what people are experiencing, and you can create alerts based on those responses that alert you, send you emails or messages. Uh, to tell you that something has happened, like customer has been interested in your product, or otherwise, um, so that you are you are up to date with what's going on without having to browse the same message. The, the most important part of our system is definitely the web client because that's how the end user will experience the product. Uh, the web client is uh, an, an, an embeddable floating chat interface uh, for which people can interact with the virtual character. Uh, the virtual character is actually optional; you can add it or remove it if you don't want the virtual but that's also a possibility. Um, but the virtual character itself is actually fairly small, downloads very quickly uh, in the background, um, will add very little to this, uh, the size of your site or will negatively impact your user experience in any way. Um, the, uh, the, the speech is actually screened, but otherwise the, uh, the interaction is actually run through a, a local script execution. The advantage of that is that our virtual character is extremely responsive. If the user responds, you don't have to wait for very long at all. In fact, it's instantaneous for the uh, uh, for the widgets to uh, for the web client to actually respond to the user. So even if the internet connection is not that great, once it's been downloaded, you get a pretty smooth experience. Um, this widget is, is compatible with all modern browsers and devices. Uh, it uses WebGL technology to render a a real-time animated pretty character. That's a fancy technology, but it's been around for a few years and it's now. Uh, um, widely available with, with over 98% of, of users having access to it. And as I said, if, there's, if you don't want a virtual character, or if the virtual character is not available because the browser doesn't support it, the virtual character just isn't there. And you can still impact the chat. The alternative to the web client is a native app. That's where we started. We actually started with um, uh, native apps because the web technology wasn't ready when, when we first started this, um, this endeavor. Um, there are some advantages to using a, a native app. It is a, a computation more efficient, which allows us to, to do more detailed renderings of characters. But also, there are certain mobile capabilities such as push notifications, local notifications, speech recognition um, that are quite powerful and interesting capabilities to have. Um, we have apps available for, uh, for Windows, uh, for iOS, and for Android, and have them some of them in the App Store. Um, uh, if you're interested in that, just, just get in touch with us. Um, obviously, if you want a particular unique solution, you will have to customize it for you and get it through the app. So we generally promote the web client more these days because it's just quicker to get the solution out there than through an app. Because you have to download the app and it has to be approved by Apple, for example, which is a, it's a big piece of work. And finally, there is the cloud service itself, the, the, the magic thing in the back of it actually connects all of those things together. And the important thing here is that uh, we had to make sure that it's really uh, high quality, that it's robust. Can handle the load. If lots of people want to use your service, it's not a problem. This service can handle it. It is secure. Your data is secure. It's in Australia uh, or in any other location. We actually set this up on Azure and we set up multiple instances in different regions. Uh, we can set up an instance facility for you so that you have complete control over the service and the data, or we can manage it all for you uh, without you having to think about it. Um, we have uh, integration with lots of uh, other services. Um, the service itself can send out emails, uh, can uh, in fact with Zapier to, to deliver task automation based on user's responses. Um, our characters with speech synthesis to multiple services, we can integrate artificial intelligence to make them more intelligent. Um, 
depending on the application that it can be essential or, or just, just something nice to have. And it offers a whole bunch of APIs that are documented that allow you to interact uh, through your service with the virtual character. The virtual character can interact with your web page. Um, and you can export data directly from our cloud back end into your service and so on. So there's a huge amount of flexibility around that. And the question is, of course, how do you want it to work for yourself? And I will hand over to Tanya now to uh, elucidate that a bit further. Thanks so much, Bob. All right, so by now you might be thinking to yourself, heck, there's a, there's a platform, uh, there's a solution available. I'm pretty interested in uh, using an IBA in my business. So we can help you do that. And the way we do that is by beginning with a proof of concept. But we ask some fairly critical questions before we even get started. Um, you, you need to be ready for it. Do you have resources and commitment and time uh, to um, to deal with this particular, to, to, to create a, a proof of concept? Uh, you need to ask these questions, and, and it's typically in a, in a cross-functional uh, team. So, what is the, the strategic context? So are we interested in, um, in customer service for what purpose? Uh, so strategy is really quite, is really very important. You might be thinking about what are the challenges and what are the opportunities in your current ways of communications, then start to think about some candidate use cases, you're probably already thinking about those now, prioritise them, and then determine the feasibility. And this is something that we work with our customers with uh, typically in a workshop or several workshops uh, where we get to an end point and say, yes, this is uh, something you'd like to do or something uh, that perhaps not at this time. That's either is fine. Um, once uh, you've decided to go down that path, once our customers have decided to go down that path, here's the steps that we take. And you may have come across these before. Uh, the first is, of course, to design the purpose and the scope. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we want the initial proof of concept to be quite constrained. Uh, this is a practice. This is uh, information gathering. So um, the scope needs to be constrained. And then it's about designing the dialogue flow. So how we use those dialogue trees, how we use NLP, um, and uh, and how those how they, that content is created. Creating content uses subject matter experts um, and uh, from, usually from a range of places in the organisation, uh, from marketing through operations, um, and IT are often very interested as well. And personify. Your IBA has a personality, whether you like it or not. Um, those words are that, they, that your character says um, come from a personality. And so uh, deciding on what that personality is is all part of it. Deployment is about um, the platform that you choose. Um, and of course, uh, that, that's really about deciding around questions of flexibility um, or uh, and cost. And finally, optimizing. Um, a minimum viable product means that you start with something that absolutely works um, with the full knowledge that, uh, that it can be optimised based on user feedback. And uh, so real world testing is what we do. I guess I want to leave you with some final thoughts about what, um, what IBAs mean, mean for us. Can they replace humans? Well, look, no, they can't. But they can perform some really important functions uh, that are customer facing. Do they have conversations in the same way that a human does? It's not exactly the same, but they can be surprisingly engaging. Um, and that's from our experience and that's from our research and it's becoming more and more known. Are they as intelligent as a human brain? Well, no, they're not, but they can perform functions at scale 24-7 um, reliably and in a way that can take load from your organisation. And are they in the realms of fantasy? Well, not our IBAs, they're not in the realms of fantasy, but 
Unfortunately, some still are. This is a movie about a guy that falls in love with his uh, virtual assistant. Now, that is a fantasy. That is still a fiction. Um, but what we do at Clevertar is actually quite serious. We help people solve real business problems and help their users solve issues that are sometimes very, uh, very personal and very sensitive. So um, IVAs are absolutely a part of the business future. And I want to close with some of the needs that we've addressed uh, in very recent times, just to give you an idea of uh, where we see uh, the future of intelligent virtual agents. So perhaps uh, you have business needs that, that, around costs that need to be reduced. Um, it's a constant issue for organisations, of course, uh, and a view to their bottom line. So one of our government customers, for instance, um, has um, a, a customer service centre that's dealing with very complex legislation. Um, they have users with um, needs and they need to understand their rights and responsibilities. And this is where an IBA can shoulder a load, can really share that load uh, with the um, customer uh, service centre. Um, commercially, um, we, we know that in sales, we look for a frictionless journey for the consumer uh, through a website. Now, in a bricks and mortar situation, a frictionless journey would, would be assisted by a person offering assistance, a, a sales assistant. We're working with uh, a customer at the moment on for creating a virtual sales assistant, one that's led by the user, uh, not led by the sales assistant, but absolutely led by the user, offering advice and assistance and reducing that friction. So absolutely adding to the, uh, to the uh, revenue generation side of the business. We're also helping customers where um, their consumers are dissatisfied with support due to, due to um, call wait times or unanswered calls, but very significantly here, we know that customer service agents themselves get frustrated with the frequent flyers. You know, and, and in fact, um, our intelligent virtual agent was brought in specifically to deal with that issue. Um, this is about reducing frustration as well as extending service. And finally, um, perhaps you have a need to extend your digital channel. Um, it is surprising that um, intelligent virtual agents can get involved in situations where you might think only a human conversation uh, would be relevant, like checking in with a consumer, seeing how they're going, seeing how their mental health is going or their well-being. But in fact, we've shown that an intelligent virtual agent can perform that very function um, and then simply create red flags for the uh, customer support, support service rather than um, making thousands of calls, uh, simply following up those most urgent. So they're just some of the business needs that we face here at Clemta. Look, I hope you've really enjoyed uh, our presentation today. Um, I would like to open the floor to questions. Uh, and uh, Martin and I would be very happy to answer. Website examples using Clevertar. So customer website examples using Clevertar? Yeah, certainly. I think, um, well, there's a couple that spring to mind. One would be um, Mate, which is a, a telco. Um, now, at the moment, their intelligent virtual agent is available during the daytime. Uh, sorry, after hours, not during the daytime. Um, so you just need to navigate to the support uh, section of the site. Um, and that might be worth uh, checking out. Um, or uh, consumer and business services uh, here in South Australia, have a look at, um, have a look at uh, their support agent, Claire, um, there. Or if you'd like more, just Ping us an email. Thank you. Yes, thank right. you. Any other questions? That's uh, look. That's quite okay. Um, 
What I would like to do is uh, offer our, um, um, our email addresses, which are on the presentation. I believe they'll be available to download. So uh, if you'd like to get in touch, please do. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We've um, uh, really enjoyed uh, speaking with you today. And uh, join us again in the future when we um, well, talk about some more interesting things to do. Thank you. Bye.